and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This is the second of three episodes about the War of the Austrian Succession. If you're just joining in, things will make a lot more sense if you go back one episode and start with Prussian Roulette Part 1. Also, just a quick note... I was a bit clumsy when I was writing the script for that episode, and at different points I referred to the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont, and the Kingdom of Savoy Sardinia. All of these are technically acceptable names for the same kingdom, which has the complete name of Savoy Piedmont Sardinia. It's a kingdom in the northwestern area of modern-day Italy, uh, including the island of Sardinia as well as parts of modern-day France and Switzerland. Anyway, sorry if that confused anyone, and from now on I will do my best just to call this kingdom the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, so we can have some consistency. Well, This actually doesn't make for a bad segue, because where we left off at the end of the year 1743, the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia has switched sides. With funding from Great Britain, they are now fielding an army of 40,000 troops. As the war stands, it's Austria and Piedmont Sardinia on one side, supporting Austrian Archduchess Maria Theresa's claims to her old family lands. The British are also helping on the Austrian side, fielding an army in Germany, made up of troops not just from Great Britain, but primarily from the German Kingdom of Hanover, which is in a personal union with Great Britain under King George II. There separate kingdoms, but George II rules them both, and he is supporting the Austrians. On the other side of this conflict, just to catch everybody up with where we were at the end of last episode, on the other side we have Charles Albert, who is the elector of Bavaria and has successfully gotten himself elected as Holy Roman Emperor Charles VII beating out Maria Theresa's husband, Francis. Charles continues to claim a number of Maria Theresa's territories, but Maria Theresa, with a little help, has managed to push Charles's armies almost entirely out of Germany. She's actually taken over his land in Bavaria. And... Uh, This is despite the fact that France and Spain are both fighting on Charles's side. These are both big colonial powers hoping to get their own little pieces of Habsburg land. Remember, Maria Theresa is the heiress of the Habsburg dynasty. She controls all of these territories throughout Europe, including northern Italy, where the Spanish would like some land, and the Austrian Netherlands, uh, where the French would really like to expand. But so far, Maria Theresa's stubbornness and uh, British financial aid have put the Austrian side ahead in this war. Uh, To counter this, the Franco-Spanish alliance decides to support a pretender to the British throne. The idea is to start a civil war in the British Isles, ending British military support for their allies and, most importantly, cutting off British financial aid. Now, this plan takes a while to develop, and we won't see the fruits of it until 1745, but I want to bookmark that. While we're talking about all of this stuff that's going on in Central Europe, there is this whole diplomatic and military plot going on in Western Europe to overthrow King George II of England. But first I want to talk about Frederick the Great's second invasion of Maria Theresa's land, known as the Second Silesian War, which is yet another one of those little sub-wars that make up the War of the Austrian Succession. At the end of 1743, 
Russia and Sweden have made peace with each other. As you'll recall from last episode, they've been fighting each other this entire time. And now that they're at peace, there's a risk for both sides in the War of the Austrian Succession. The Russians are Austrian allies and might decide to enter the war on the Austrian side. Meanwhile, the Swedish are enemies of the Habsburgs and might enter any war against Austria. In Prussia, Frederick the Great fears Russian involvement most of all. While he's technically at peace with Austria, he has just taken a huge chunk of Austrian land, that territory of Silesia that we talked about in the last episode. He knows that as soon as Maria Theresa makes peace with the French and the Spanish, she's going to want Silesia back, and she might just get Russian help for her effort. Spoiler alert, the Russians don't actually enter the war at this time, but Frederick is very afraid that they will. So he decides to attack Maria Theresa again, while she's still busy fighting the French and the Spanish. Not only that, but as you'll recall from last episode, the Austrians have actually pushed the French all the way back to the Rhine at this point the river separating France proper from what we call Germany. This means that the Austrian troops are all the way in the west of Germany, and central Germany and Bohemia are relatively undefended. Frederick reasons that he can launch a quick attack into Bohemia and conquer the entire kingdom. By the time the Austrians are able to respond the Prussian army will already occupy all the good defensive positions. He can eat up more of Maria Theresa's territory, and Prussia will be that much more intimidating. Now, to help with this, Frederick makes a secret deal with the French. This is hard to hammer out. They're a little bit upset at him still for making a separate peace with the Austrians once, but he hammers out a deal with them. When he attacks Bohemia and Austrian armies predictably redeploy from France to Bohemia, the French are supposed to pursue the Austrians and harass their supply lines. Uh, Number one, this will help the French, uh, since it will push the Austrians back from the Rhine, but it will also slow down the Austrians, giving Frederick's Prussians more time to fortify their defenses. But the French are distracted. For one thing, I neglected to mention that the Dutch Republic is also involved in the war on the Austrian side. So far, All they've been doing is sitting back in the Austrian Netherlands, helping the Austrians to defend themselves as the French bombard their defensive fortresses. This has kept a bunch of French troops tied down, though. Not only that, but the French have 12,000 troops just sitting in Dunkirk, preparing for an attack on Britain that never happens. This means there aren't as many French troops on the German frontier as there should be, especially considering the fact that the Austrian forces have crossed the Rhine by early 1744. But because they don't have a lot of troops in the area, the French don't have much of a pursuit force ready to begin with. And to further complicate matters, King Louis XV falls ill with smallpox in August of 1744. While he eventually recovers, his illness temporarily paralyzes the French state. And this is unfortunate for Frederick because August 1744 is the month that he launches his invasion of Bohemia. His forces cross into Bohemia on August 15th and by September 16th, they have taken the capital city of Prague. But, as I said, the French are distracted, so when the Austrians pull their main army back to Bohemia, 
there's nobody harassing their supply lines and chasing after them. They're able to move at full speed in good order without losing any supplies. And instead of Frederick getting to dig in until winter, when armies become harder to maneuver, he has to deal with the Austrian relief army almost immediately when it arrives in the middle of October. And his defenses are still unprepared. Frederick's forces can't remain spread out throughout Bohemia, so he consolidates his army and tries to force an engagement and push the Austrians back in the field. This is something he's normally very good at, is winning a straightforward fight. But the Austrian army avoids a battle. They employ a Fabian strategy the strategy of not fighting your enemy. They maneuver away from Frederick's main force and constantly raid his supply lines instead. By the middle of November, Frederick is unable to keep supplying his army, so he's forced to pull back from southern Bohemia into northern Bohemia and the city of Prague itself. And shortly thereafter, in early December, his force is pushed further north back into Silesia where he started. But at least up there, the rough terrain allows them to take up defensible positions for the winter. And the fact that he's had control of that territory for a few years now means that his supply lines are fairly stable. During the winter, while the Austrians are reclaiming Bohemia... Uh, Bavarian troops under uh, Emperor Charles VII, well, they fully reoccupy Bavaria in southern Germany since the Austrians have been forced to pull back those armies. And on paper, it looks like the Austrians are once again in a bad spot. Right? They've just been rolled back to central Germany again, but Maria Theresa is able to use diplomacy to improve her position. Remember Augustus III, uh, King of Poland, Lithuania, who's also the elector of Saxony? The guy whose lands surround a lot of Frederick the Great's? He started out the war trying to take land from Maria Theresa before withdrawing due to a lack of funds, mostly. Well, the British and the Dutch start funding him, this time in a defensive alliance against the French. And then in May of 1745, Maria Theresa convinces him to join her in an offensive alliance against the Prussians. She'll take back Silesia, and Augustus III can take a chunk of Brandenburg from Frederick. Saxony is now on the other side of the war, fighting with the Austrians. And while all of this diplomacy and maneuvering is going on, and the Bavarian troops seem to be having so much success in the field, Charles VII, Holy Roman Emperor and Elector of Bavaria, has died. He's died in January, shortly after retaking his capital city of Munich. This sets off a political earthquake, because once again Maria Theresa has the opportunity to get her husband Francis elected emperor, if she has the votes. At this time, there are nine votes in the Imperial Electoral College. Mainz, Trier, and Cologne are small religious territories, and by this point in history, they try to stay out of politics. Unless the six secular electors are split three to three, they're almost guaranteed to vote for whoever gets the most secular votes. Saxony will vote for Francis as will the Kingdom of Hanover, and since Austrian troops have retaken Bohemia, Maria Theresa is now Queen Regnant, and that gives Francis another vote for a total of three. Prussia, via the territory of Brandenburg, will undoubtedly oppose her, as will the Palatinate, for various political reasons. So, 
If Bavaria decides to oppose Francis in the election, that will split the secular vote three to three. At that point, it's anybody's guess how the three religious electors will vote. A strong enough opposition candidate might win, or more likely, a compromise candidate of some kind. So, while Maria Theresa is wheeling and dealing to get Augustus III to join this offensive alliance against the Prussians, she's also trying to come to an accommodation with the Bavarians now that Charles is dead. Charles VII's son, Maximilian III of Bavaria, tries to put up a fight, but on April 15, 1745, his army, along with a French force, is defeated in battle by the Austrians. And a week later, on April 22, he agrees to make peace with Maria Theresa. In the peace treaty, he renounces all of his father's claims on Habsburg lands, and he pledges to support Francis in the election. Maria Theresa, meanwhile, retroactively recognizes Charles VII's legitimacy as Holy Roman Emperor. So when you look at a list of emperors, there is no asterisk next to his name. He was the real deal. With Bavaria out of the war, the election of Francis as emperor is all but guaranteed by the middle of 1745. The fight in Central Europe is now reduced to the fight between Maria Theresa and Augustus of Saxony on one side and Frederick the Great on the other. Ultimately, we can forget about Augustus. This is a battle of Maria Theresa's stubbornness and diplomatic skill against Frederick the Great's military prowess. And make no mistake, Maria Theresa is determined. She's already lost Bohemia once, in 1741, and in 1745 she has no intention of letting Frederick the Great take it back again. The following quote is from a letter she wrote during the 1741 invasion, but her feelings remain just the same in 1745. Writing to her Bohemian Chancellor Prince Kinski, Maria Theresa says, quote, So Prague is lost. Here then, Kinski, we find ourselves at the sticking point where only courage can save the country and the queen. For without the country, I should indeed be a poor princess. My own resolve is taken. To stake everything, win or lose, on saving Bohemia and it is with this in view that you should work and lay your plans. It may involve destruction and desolation, which twenty years will be insufficient to restore, but I must hold the country in the soil, and for this all my armies, all the Hungarians, shall die before I surrender an inch of it. This, then, is the crisis. Do not spare the country, only hold it. Do all you can to help your people and to keep the troops contented, lacking nothing. You know better than I the consequences of failure in this. You will say that I am cruel. That is true. But I know that all the cruelties I commit today to hold the country, I shall one day be in a position to make good a hundredfold. And this I shall do. But for the present, I close my ear to pity. Unquote. At this time, Maria Theresa isn't just trying to hold on to Bohemia. She remains equally committed to retaking Silesia, which she'd lost in her last fight with Frederick. As you imagine, she is not going to give up easily. But Frederick the Great has already beaten her armies in battle more than once. Between his growing skills as a general and his well-disciplined troops, he still poses a threat to the better-funded Austrians. And between the First and Second Silesian Wars, he has improved his army even more. Frederick believes in mobility above all else, and his new reforms reflect that. He reforms his cavalry as faster, lighter cavalry who excel at raiding and outflanking the enemy. Even the heavy cavalry, the cuirassiers, are lighter equipped than their counterparts in other armies, so they can move faster. 
Frederick also establishes new artillery drills, so his big guns are able to move around, set up, load, and fire faster than before. This campaign, the Second Silesian War, is primarily the story of three battles. Well, three main battles and a lot of maneuvering and smaller fights, but I'm going to focus on those three battles. You'll notice that in two of them, Frederick faces off against Charles of Lorraine, one of Maria Theresa's top field marshals. He's the guy Frederick beat in the First Silesian War at the Battle of Chotositz. Now, Charles seems to be in his position because he's politically connected, and historians rightfully view him as a below-average military commander. But I have to stand up for the guy a little bit, uh, because if you're looking at his win-loss record, it's hard not to notice that the most prominent losses are to Frederick the Great, one of the greatest military commanders of all time. Meanwhile, between the First and Second Silesian Wars, Charles has actually been successfully fighting against the French for a couple of years. He's like a halfway decent boxer who keeps getting matched up against Mike Tyson in his prime. It's likely that some of his losses would have been wins if he hadn't kept battling Frederick the Great. Anyway, minor point, but I just wanted to point that out for the military history nuts out there. The first of the three great battles of the Second Silesian War is the Battle of Hohenfriedberg, fought in June of 1745. In May, Frederick gathers an army of 60,000 men in Silesia. Marching towards him, fresh off a winter of rest, is a 40,000-man Austrian army under Charles of Lorraine, with 19,000 auxiliary Saxon troops for a total of 59,000, so the armies are basically equal in size. Frederick doesn't want to fight in the mountains, though. It's great defensive terrain, sure, but he's built this army for mobility, and the last thing he wants is to get stuck fighting in some pass somewhere where his army can get bottled up and trapped. Instead, he retreats further north into Silesia to an area where there's open country, and he also uses a double agent in the Austrian camp to deceive Charles into thinking that he's weaker than he is and that he's retreating in fear before the Austrians. And this little bit of subterfuge works as intended. Charles pursues a little bit too quickly and he gets careless, and on June 3rd, he sets up camp outside the town of Hohenfriedberg and makes no effort to entrench his men or fortify his position. He's so overconfident that he doesn't even send out a little bit of cavalry to scout the surrounding area and look out for enemy troops, which would be standard procedure. And because he hasn't scouted, Charles has absolutely no idea that Frederick's army is just a few miles away. Frederick, meanwhile, knows exactly where the Austrians are and exactly how many there are. He decides to take Charles by surprise, and he makes a night march against the enemy. In case there are any Austrian scouts, he even orders his men to leave their tents pitched back in the camp and throw extra logs on the fires so they keep burning all night and it looks like everybody's in bed. The Austrians are encamped in an arc stretching from east to west, with the wings slightly forwards of the center. They're left flank is anchored by a small village, and the right flank is anchored by a stream. And in front of them is a pair of elevations with another village and a stream in front of that. And to get across the stream, Frederick's men have to cross a small bridge in the dead of night as silently as possible. You can imagine walking across this wooden bridge and 
everybody's barely daring to breathe in case there's an Austrian scout and then somebody steps on a squeaky plank, right? But they get across, and the first group of troops to cross, around 8,000 infantry and a few thousand cavalry, well, they're tasked with seizing the two elevations south of the village and north of the Austrian camp. This will be a nice, strong position to attack from right in the middle of the Austrian line. Well, when they arrive with the breaking dawn, these advanced elements of the Prussian army don't find empty hills ready to be occupied. Instead, they find that some Saxon infantrymen have already camped out on both of the hills. Prussian scouts hadn't noticed them because they hadn't lit any campfires. And the Saxons are alerted before the Prussians completely close with them, and they hastily form a defensive battle line. And they initially put up a surprisingly stiff resistance for people who have been caught by surprise first thing in the morning. And the noise from the fighting awakens the people in the main Saxon and Austrian camps further behind. Now, the Austrians who make up the bulk of the army, they occupy the center and right of the main line, and they're slow to get out of their tents, and they slowly form up, and at the moment they pose no threat to anybody. But the Saxons at the left side of the Allied line are more disciplined. They're already grabbing their guns and scrambling to join their formations and defend their camp. This is where another aspect of Frederick's leadership comes into play. Instead of micromanaging every aspect of the battle, he allows and even expects his subcommanders to take the initiative as the battle develops. So, even as Frederick, at the rear of his army, is ordering six 24-pound cannons across the bridge to fire on the Saxons on the hills, the man commanding the units attacking those hills, uh, Richard de Moulin, he decides to bypass them, at least partially. Uh, leaving his infantry to deal with the Saxons on the hills, he gathers his cavalry and maneuvers around the right of the hills towards the Saxon camp. The Saxon cavalry comes out to meet the Prussian cavalry, and the fight on that flank devolves into a chaotic melee, with the formations losing all of their cohesion and the forces kind of mashing together. Desmoulins' infantry on the hills drives the Saxons back towards their camp in a fighting retreat. When they get all the way back to the Saxon camp, some Saxon infantry have successfully formed up, and it looks like they might be able to beat back these pursuing Prussians, but more Prussian infantry are pouring through the gap between the two hills, having just recently crossed the bridge onto the battlefield. And another Prussian commander, Leopold of Anhalt Dessau, sees an opportunity. In his book, Frederick the Great, A Military History, American historian Dennis Showalter describes what happens next. Quote, As the rival cavalries decimated each other, infantry began reaching the field. The Saxons, who had been camped on the Allied left, took up their main position in a zone of broken ground. It was ideal country for light troops, and offered solid defensive terrain for the Saxon line battalions, particularly as their regimental guns moved into supporting positions. This was the moment of Leopold of Anhalt Dessau. Pulling nine battalions off the line of march, he formed them into fighting lines and led them forward. Other units rallied to the initiative, and by the time the young Dessauer's attack developed, he was at the head of 21 battalions. In accordance with their new regulations, the Prussians advanced with their muskets at the shoulder. Linesmen and grenadiers, the bluecoats moved forward through the canister of the Saxon guns, through the Saxon musketry, 
until they delivered their first volleys almost literally in the whites of their enemies' eyes. The psychological and physical force of the Prussian attack was not enough to break the Saxon infantry immediately. Instead of running, the Elector's battalions, mercenaries, and Landskinder kept up the fight almost for two hours, meeting the Prussian volleys with their own, falling back from obstacle to obstacle, making the Dessauer's men pay for every yard won. Casualties were heavy on both sides. Not until 7 a.m. did what remained of the Saxons retreat, after waiting in vain for support from Austrian allies, who spent most of the time bought by the Saxons shaking out of their tents and into fighting formation. Unquote. By now, the Prussians control the left side of the field from the Austrian perspective. But that small advance under Dumoulin has done most of the heavy lifting, along with the battalions that broke off under Leopold of Anhalt. The main Prussian force has just finished crossing the stream into the battlefield, and they're going to have to do without Desmoulins' men and many of the others who have fought with the Saxons. Those guys are tired. The cavalry have taken heavy casualties, and their horses are winded. The troops themselves have already been fighting since dawn after an all-night march. As Frederick forms up the main army to attack the Austrians, the last of the Prussian cavalry are still crossing the stream when the bridge collapses. This forces the last few groups of cavalry in the line to march way around to the left of the battlefield from their perspective to find some other way around the stream. And unfortunately, the leading cavalry elements don't know that the guys behind them aren't all there. They think they outnumber the Austrian cavalry they're facing when it's the other way round. And as the infantry start to engage in the center of the battlefield, the Prussian cavalry on the left charge into the Austrian cavalry on the Austrian right flank. But like I said, they're actually outnumbered, and they start getting pushed back. This could turn the tide of the battle. If the Austrian cavalry are victorious out on the flank they can swing around and attack the Prussians from the side or even from the back, which would almost certainly win the battle for Charles of Lorraine. And this is where yet another one of Frederick's sub-commanders comes in. Hans Joachim von Zieten is the commander of the Prussian left flank cavalry, and he's with the men who got stranded on the other side of the stream. Well, he successfully leads them around to a part of the stream where there is a ford, and he gets them across, and he forms them up to join their friends, and he gets into the fight. And this doesn't force the Austrians back, but it averts disaster. It stabilizes the situation out on the flank. And again, showing initiative, some of the Prussian infantry in the center of the fight see what's going on in the flank, they split off, and they start firing into the sides of the Austrian cavalry. And this forces them to break and fall back. And the Prussian cavalry drive them off the field. And incidentally, we will be seeing more of this Prussian cavalry commander, von Zieten. He continues to rise in the army, and by the end of the Seven Years' War, he will be Frederick's overall military commander. With his cavalry falling away, Charles of Lorraine makes one last desperate attempt to push the Prussians back. He takes his remaining infantry reserves and launches them against the center of the Prussian line. And this opens up a small gap, and it looks like the Austrians might break through and split Frederick's force in half. But once again, his semi-independent command structure saves the day. There's a 
regiment of dragoons that had been in the first wave of the attack, but had never engaged with the Saxons, right? Dragoons are mounted infantry slash light, fast cavalry. Well, these dragoons had never gotten into that fight with the Saxons at the beginning of the battle. Their commander had seen the progress of the initial Prussian attack and thought that his men were unnecessary, so... Instead, he has been shadowing Frederick's infantry and watching their backs. And as a result, he is there behind the Prussian infantry line to act as a stopgap. And it's unclear whether this commander gives the order or whether Frederick delivers it from higher up, but whatever the case, this commander has his men charge into the gap where the Austrians are pouring through, and Dennis Showalter writes of this regiment, called the Bayreuther Regiment. He says, quote, Around 8.15 a.m., the Bayreuther went forward, first at a trot, then a gallop. With no time to form square, the grenadiers delivered an ineffective volley before they were ridden down and the victorious dragoons crashed into the main Austrian body. Deployed in line with no horsemen of their own at hand to take the shock, the Austrians stood their ground for a few minutes, then broke and ran for their lives. In less than a half hour, the Beirut dragoons took no fewer than 67 colors, a far greater tribute to the force of their charge than the five guns that could not be withdrawn, or the 2,500 prisoners who compared their maximum foot speed to the pace of a running horse, and sensibly threw down their arms. The regiment's own losses were less than a hundred. By nine o'clock, it is Charles of Lorraine's army that is cut in two, and his cavalry have all fled the field. He orders a general retreat, and his men fall back. Much like after the Battle of Chotizitz, Frederick is unable to chase them down because his own men are too exhausted, particularly the cavalry. So Charles is able to retreat into Bohemia with the remnants of his army. Of course, Frederick probably thinks he doesn't need to pursue. The Austrian army has suffered around 13,800 casualties in the Battle of Hohenfriedberg, including 5,000 prisoners and more than 3,000 dead. This compares to a total of fewer than 5,000 Prussian casualties. Once again, he has faced the Austrians in the field, and once again he sent them home to lick their wounds. Surely Maria Theresa will negotiate. Maria Theresa is in no mood to negotiate. If anything, she's more determined than ever to wrest Silesia back from Prussian hands. She raises more forces in northern Italy and Bohemia, and reinforces Charles of Lorraine's army. Despite this show of strength, her British ally, King George II, makes a truce with Frederick less than two months later, in August of 1745. In this agreement, called uh, the Convention of Hanover, Frederick agrees to respect the territorial integrity of Hanover, and the British agree not to infringe on Prussian territory. Keep in mind that the British aren't caving to Prussian military strength here, nor are they necessarily stabbing Austria in the back or anything like that. Remember that civil war that the French and Spanish have been hoping to start in Great Britain? Well, right around this time, there is a rebel army in Scotland led by Charles Stuart, the son of a rival claimant to the throne. The British crown is dealing with this rebellion, plus conflict with the French and Spanish at sea, plus conflict against the French on the European landmass, plus ongoing wars in the overseas colonies. The British are spread too thin right now, and by making peace with Prussia, they free up an entire front. They don't have to defend Hanover from any attack from its east, which is a major relief. 
Besides which, this British peace with the Prussians doesn't derail Maria Theresa's efforts in the slightest. Far from it. On December 13, 1745, her husband Francis is elected Francis I, Holy Roman Emperor. And while he's officially in charge, make no mistake, Francis is a puppet. Even though he is the emperor, Maria Theresa makes the important decisions. There are even a few famous incidents where the two of them have a disagreement in a meeting with the imperial cabinet, and in each case, Maria Theresa throws Francis out of the room, and the government ministers follow her lead. But despite winning this important election, Maria Theresa still has to deal with Frederick and the Prussians. Charles of Lorraine is all too eager to redeem himself for his loss in the Battle of Hohenfriedberg, which brings us to the second of the three battles I mentioned, the Battle of Sur. Frederick the Great has become overconfident. Following his victory at Hohenfriedberg, he believes the Austrians will be too beaten down to try another attack in 1745. But the Austrians have constantly been sending small raiding units of Hungarian hussars to attack Frederick's supplies. This has forced Frederick to disperse much of his army throughout Bohemia to protect those supply lines, reducing his main force to only around 22,000 men, the rest of them are out in the field guarding something. This army is acting as an observation army to keep the Austrians at bay. It's a deterrent force, and Frederick isn't even intending to stay with it personally. He intends to return to Berlin over the winter to inspect the progress on his new palace before returning to Bohemia for the spring campaign. He has good reason to be confident. Austrian forces have recently suffered setbacks in northern Italy and the Austrian Netherlands, and it would make sense for them to push back in those areas. The Prussians are not expecting an attack, and they've set up camp outside the village of Sur in Bohemia. Frederick is so confident that he camps on the low ground nearer to the village rather than on the more defensible high ground farther to the south. Charles of Lorraine's army is not far to the south, hidden in a dense forest, but it's been there for some time, facing off against Frederick's. Frederick thinks that it's also an observation army, intended to block any further Prussian attacks to the south. He has no idea that the Austrians have rebuilt their forces. In fact, the Austrian army here now numbers 40,000 strong, outnumbering Frederick's two to one. The night of September 29, 1745, is exceptionally foggy, and Charles senses an opportunity. He sends a small advance unit to take the hill south of Frederick's camp while the rest of his army quietly forms up with their backs to the forest. In the pre-dawn hours of September 30th, the Austrians are in position to launch a surprise attack on Frederick's camp. They're formed up with a strong combined force of infantry, cavalry, and artillery on the hilltop, with more cavalry off to the left to protect their flank. To the right of the hill, the rest of the Austrian infantry form up in a long line, with artillery interspersed among the troops. Far to the right are some reserve infantry, along with a protective cavalry force. And the Prussians are still in their sleeping bags. At least, most of them are. Frederick himself is already awake, attending a 5 a.m. meeting with his command staff, so when a Prussian lookout runs into the camp, shouting that the Austrians are about to attack, he's able to take command of the situation immediately. He mounts his horse and rides around the camp in a big circle, shouting commands to his soldiers and ordering the drummers to play a battle march. Within a few minutes, the entire Prussian camp is putting their boots on and preparing for battle. 
In its sewer, just like at Hohenfriedberg, we see an uncanny difference in speed between the two armies. The Austrians are moving lazily, waiting for the mist to disperse before they begin their attack. Meanwhile, the Prussian units start forming their own line within minutes. Individual units take their place in the battle line without waiting for orders, and by 8 a.m., Frederick's army is deployed in two large groups. Each group has infantry positioned nearer to the center of the battlefield, with cavalry out to the wings. As they're finishing their deployment, the fog finally clears, and the Austrian artillerymen can see their targets. They begin their barrage, and cannonballs pepper the Prussian troop formations. Frederick immediately recognizes the problem he faces. Not only is he badly outnumbered, but the Austrians hold the high ground. His broad plan is to send the cavalry on his right wing to flank the Austrians' cavalry, while the infantry from the right group move in to engage the soldiers on the hilltop. This means that the left half of his force will have to distract the rest of the Austrian army, which badly outnumbers them. He orders them to advance towards the Austrian right, but not to get too close. They're just supposed to stand at the edge of firing range so the Austrians can't help their friends on the hill without exposing their own flank. The cavalry on the Prussian right strike first, and they take the brunt of the casualties. But advancing under heavy cannon fire, they quickly reach a dip in the landscape where the Austrian cavalry are waiting. Inexplicably, the Austrians don't launch a countercharge, and the Prussian momentum drives them back into the forest and away from the battlefield. This mirrors what happened a few years ago at the Battle of Mulwitz, where Frederick's cavalry were caught flat-footed, almost losing him the battle. With their flanking cavalry driven off, some of the Austrian infantry on the hill turn around to face the Prussian cavalry. They end up engaging them behind the hill in a fight that devolves into a confused melee. Meanwhile, the other Austrians on the hilltop are having some success. When the first wave of Prussian infantry attack, they hold their ranks and rain down fire on their attackers. The Prussian infantry actually pulls back, but it's a disciplined tactical withdrawal and not a retreat. These infantry drop back behind another line of attacking infantry and reform, and this second line advances and engages the Austrians at point-blank range. Austrian artillery on the open ground to the right could fire on these Prussians, but artillery accuracy in these days isn't the greatest and they risk hitting their own men, so the Austrians refrain from firing at those attackers. At the same time, the Austrian infantry on the hilltop has gotten out of position and are now standing in front of their own cannons on the hilltop. Ideally, these guns uh, should be able to load up with canister shot and inflict fearsome casualties on the Prussians at point-blank range. But because there are Austrian soldiers standing in front of them, these guns are even more useless than the ones off to the right. Even so, the Austrians on the hilltop maintain their discipline. They don't retreat or panic. But here, Prussian drill superiority comes into play. The Prussians are firing more shots per minute than the Austrians, so the Austrians are taking heavier casualties, even as the Prussian units that had retreated are reforming to join the fight. On the Prussian left the soldiers are exhibiting less discipline. Despite explicit orders not to engage yet, excitement seems to be getting the better of them. They've slowly advanced to well within musket range, and at first they sit at that range and exchange pot shots with the Austrians, but they keep creeping forward, and eventually the entire battle line is engaged, which is what Frederick didn't want to happen, but... 
Just like the cavalry on the Austrian left, the ones on the Austrian right remain motionless, as if they're at parade rest. Rather than take the initiative and support their infantry, where they could really change the course of the battle here, they sit back and wait for orders which never come. Which does fall on Charles of Lorraine's shoulders. But regardless, by noon, the Austrians have taken too many casualties, and Charles of Lorraine orders a retreat back into the woods. To his credit, Frederick tries to pursue and destroy the Austrians this time, but as in previous battles, his cavalry is too tired or too high on adrenaline to do the job. Frederick famously writes one of his friends, quote, My cavalry came to a halt not short of the enemy rearguard. I hastened up and shouted, March forwards! Move! I was greeted with Vivat Victoria and a prolonged chorus of cries. Again I called out, March! And again, nobody wanted to move. I lost my temper. I struck out with my stick and fist, and I swore, and I think I know how to swear when I'm angry, but I could do nothing to bring my cavalrymen one step forward. They were drunk with joy and did not hear me. Unquote. Even without a pursuit, the Prussians have notched an impressive victory. At the end of the day, they've taken less than 4,000 casualties, compared to over 7,500 Austrian casualties. Once again, the Austrian army has been humiliated by a Prussian force, this time by one with half of their numbers. The Battle of Sur isn't all good news for Frederick. During the fighting, some Austrian cavalry sneak around to the rear and raid the Prussian camp, stealing nearly a million ducats worth of money and valuables. Converting money from historical time periods is always tricky, but this is tens of millions of dollars in today's dollars. On a more personal note, they steal Frederick's collection of flutes, which upsets him greatly. Despite his dedication to the army, he still enjoys playing the flute to relax, like he did as a young man. One of the first things he does after the battle is commission a new flute. Frederick's brother-in-law is also killed in the battle. As you'll recall, he doesn't have a good relationship with his wife, and at this point he doesn't even bother to send her a letter to tell her about her brother's death. Eventually he does, but only after several of his advisors badger him about it. If you're Frederick, you've got to be thinking that this is it. You've beaten the Austrians twice in a row in major battles, four times if you count the First Silesian War. You've beaten them on equal terms, and you've beaten them against two-to-one odds under surprise attack. They're at war with the French and the Spanish, two of the world's biggest powers. Surely Maria Theresa will do the pragmatic thing and make peace. Well, instead, she quickly coordinates another attack with the Saxons. Instead of trying to take Silesia back directly, a Saxon army will attack one of Frederick's two armies, which is stationed northwest of Saxony, just inside the borders of Brandenburg. A second army, a combined Austrian-Saxon force led by Charles of Lorraine, will then march straight north from Saxony into Berlin, Frederick's capital city, bypassing Silesia altogether. And they'll be able to do this unopposed because Frederick's second army is wintering in Silesia east of Saxony. Right? By the time this army even learns of the attack, Berlin will have fallen into Austrian hands. Basically, they're going to stop trying to take back lost territory and go straight for a dagger to the heart. It's a good plan on paper, but Frederick himself isn't with his army in Silesia, nor is he with his army in the West. He has gone back to Berlin for the winter, as he'd intended. But his intelligence network is hard at work 
and when he reaches the city of Potsdam on the way to Berlin, he catches wind of the Austrian plan, and he dispatches messengers to both of his armies. The army in Silesia moves first, pushing west into Saxony to cut off Charles of Lorraine's Austrian army, which is marching north across the border from Austria. As the armies get close, on November 13, 1745, their forward elements start to clash. You may remember Hans Joachim von Zieten, the cavalry commander who got his troops across the stream and saved the day at the Battle of Hohenfriedberg. Well, he has a force of around 4,500 cavalry, and they run into a small Saxon garrison of around 1,300 infantry and 900 cavalry in the town of Katholik Hennersdorf. They take the Saxons completely by surprise and capture almost all of them. Charles of Lorraine is just a few miles to the south, but isn't ready for a major battle. He'd planned on getting into Saxony quietly and resupplying on his way through the country, so rather than stay and fight, he retreats back into Austria. And this spoils any immediate hope the Saxons may have for reinforcements. For now, Frederick's eastern army is sitting in southern Saxony, keeping Charles's army at bay. Meanwhile, in the west, the Prussian army is commanded by Leopold Max of Anhalt-Dessau, whose nickname is the Old Dessauer. And you may remember him from last episode, where he played a key role in the Battle of Chotositz, holding off the Austrians while Frederick brought in reinforcements. Well, now he's been ordered to march into Saxony and advance as far as he can. If he can take the capital city of Dresden, he's ordered to do it. Frederick has flipped the script, and he's going for a dagger to the heart of Saxony. Right, take Dresden, and you almost certainly knock Augustus III out of the war. And this brings us to the last of the three major battles of the Second Silesian War, and I'm not going to go as in-depth as the last two, because, number one, we still have a lot to talk about today, and time is a factor, but number two, none of our major characters is really present. Leopold Max is unhappy about making a forced march in the winter, but even though he constantly argues about his orders, his army slowly advances through Saxony. On September 15, 1745, they arrive near the Battle of Kesselsdorf, where Saxon Field Marshal Rutovsky has fortified with the Saxon main army. Kesselsdorf is not far outside of Dresden and protects a strategic river crossing, so it's a smart place to make a stand. On paper, Rutovsky is in a good position. His Saxons outnumber Leopold Max's Prussians 35,000 to 32,000. Charles of Lorraine has also finally managed to get into Saxony and is hurrying to their aid with a relief army. All Rutovsky has to do is defend a reasonably strong position against a less numerous opponent. Leopold Max realizes that he needs to move quickly. There's no way he could beat a much larger combined Austrian-Saxon force, so he needs to beat the Saxons as quickly as possible. He orders a direct assault on the Saxon defenses, but these are solid stone defenses. We're talking about a low wall that's basically a pile of rubble gathered from the surrounding area, but put a bunch of guys with muskets and artillery behind that rubble and you've got a tough fortification. The first wave of Prussian infantry comes under intense fire, and after taking heavy casualties, they fall back. Then, the Saxon defenders get overconfident. Instead of remaining at their posts, they leave their defenses and start chasing the retreating Prussians. But there's a second wave of Prussian attackers, and these troops run right into the Saxons, who get caught out on open ground without their pile of rubble to protect them. Again, the Prussians' superior drilling and discipline gives them an edge in a straight fight, and the Saxons go running. Now, 
the village of Kesselsdorf is only one half of the battle line. The Saxons and Prussians are also exchanging fire across a river that runs next to the village. There, the Saxons are holding up just fine because there is a river between them and the Prussians they're facing, but when they see the troops from the village running away, they run away as well. At the end of the day, the Prussian army suffers around 5,000 casualties. The Saxons suffer fewer than 4,000 dead and wounded, but more than 6,500 are captured, along with more than half the army's artillery. Rutovsky manages to regather his forces and slips off to try and link up with Charles of Lorraine. But his defeat leaves Dresden undefended, with Leopold Max's victorious army just a few miles to the southwest. By now, Frederick the Great has joined his army in the east and is also advancing towards Dresden from that direction. Despite Charles of Lorraine's nearby relief army, the pressure is too much for the Saxon elector Augustus III. He agrees to peace terms, which have been negotiated by a group of Prussian, Saxon, Austrian, and British diplomats. Frederick is in the field, and he is initially unaware that a peace agreement has been reached. His army links up with Leopold Max's, and the complete Prussian army marches to Dresden. Somewhere along the way, things get sorted out, and when the Prussians arrive, the surrender of the city's garrison is purely ceremonial. In his book, Frederick the Great, A Life in Deeds and Letters, British historian Giles McDonough writes, quote, Frederick had arrived in Dresden at the right time. On 18 December, there was a performance of Hasse's most popular opera, Arminio which impressed him deeply. But even going to the opera every night and sending huge consignments of Messien porcelain back to Berlin was not enough. He was in a gloomy mood again, although that might have had something to do with digestion. He told his faithful Fredersdorf that he was as constipated as a Turk and that his belly was as fat as a barrel. When the peace was signed in Dresden on Christmas Day, he expressed the hope that reason would replace lunacy from now on. He was confirmed in his possession of the whole of Silesia once again, and in turn he gave his a posteriori vote for the election of Francis Stephen as Holy Roman Emperor. His new friend, the secretary of the French legation in the Saxon capital, Claude Etienne d'Arget, congratulated him on bringing peace to Europe. Frederick wrote in reply, that he had been made aware of the fickleness of his position. Had I been unlucky today, I'd be a ruler without a throne, and my subjects would be suffering a terrible fate. My God, shall I never enjoy my life? From now on I shan't hurt a fly, except to defend myself. Frederick returned to his capital on 28 December. He stopped for lunch at the hated house of Wusterhausen, which he had given to William. Berlin had experienced moments of uncertainty when it was thought that the city might fall to the enemy. Dawn was announced by a peal of bells, and the militia began to assemble before the houses of their captains. Prince Henry went to join his brothers at Wusterhausen, and all three drove into town in an open phaeton. On the heath that Brits to the south of Berlin, they were met by a procession of young mounted merchants from the city, led by the royal postmaster. There were a hundred postilions in blue, the butchers in brown, the master of the forests and the huntsmen in green, followed by volunteers, pages, guards, and coaches stuffed with nobles. At the gates there was a deputation from the municipal magistrates, waiting to welcome Frederick to his residence. The king of Prussia returned to Berlin to enjoy the fruits of his victory. He was received under triumphal arches. All the people tossed him laurel wreaths, crying, Es liebe Friedrich der Grosse. Others shouted, Vivat Frederikus Magnus, or Vivat, Vivat Frederikus Rex, Victor Augustus Magnus Felix Pater Patriae. Whatever the language, the feeling was much the same. The people were overjoyed to see their victorious king. 
Frederick the Great. Unquote. Frederick the Great has just won his historical title by acclamation. And the Second Silesian War is over. The result is a return to the status quo antebellum. In the treaty, Frederick agrees to recognize Francis I as Holy Roman Emperor and to stop his attacks on Bohemia. In return, he gets to keep Silesia, and Augustus III will pay him a substantial sum of money in reparations. Frederick, the irresistible force, has met Maria Theresa, the immovable object, and thousands of men have bled and died for nothing. Maria Theresa only agrees to let go of Silesia again because Augustus III says that he's making peace with Frederick with or without her, so she's not going to have her Saxon allies anymore. She's also under intense pressure from the British, who want her to focus on the French and the Spanish and wrap this war up already. Speaking of the French and the Spanish, they're both upset at Frederick, who has made a separate peace with the Austrians for the second time in three years. This badly damages Prussia's diplomatic reputation with these powers, which is bad news for Frederick. Eventually, Maria Theresa is going to try and take Silesia back, and he's going to need allies when that happens. Keep that in mind, but... Before we talk about the diplomatic fallout from all this, I want to rewind a little bit. We've talked about what happened in 1744 through 1745 in Central Europe, but the Second Silesian War is only part of the War of Austrian Succession. What's been going on in the other theaters of war? In Italy, Austria is facing two threats. Their lands are north of the boot, and their armies need to contend with the French, Spanish, and Neapolitan armies from the south of the boot. Yes, Naples is still a separate kingdom at this time, and it's ruled by King Charles VII, son of Spanish King Philip V. Well, the... Franco-Spanish Neapolitan side and the Austrian side, they fight to a standstill in a series of exchanges that culminate in an Austrian attempt to abduct Charles in August of 1744. He gets wind of this plot and barely escapes the Austrian soldiers by climbing out a window and riding away in his underwear. His troops end up winning the ensuing fight without him with French and Spanish soldiers doing most of the fighting, but they take a lot of casualties, and Naples is in no state to attack anybody anytime soon, so the Austrian troops move back north. They need to reinforce that area against a Franco-Spanish force that has marched through the Republic of Genoa along the Mediterranean coast into northern Italy and this force is slowly pushing back their armies in that area. The French and Spanish commanders don't get along at all, and this hampers their coordination, but they still defeat the Piedmont Sardinian army in September of 1745, opening the door to the wealthy Habsburg-owned lands of Milan, Parma, and Mantua. And that's where things stand at the end of 1745. Meanwhile, the French are engaged in constant fighting against the Austrian Netherlands, which are north of France on the Atlantic coast between France and the Dutch Republic. Basically, the Austrian Netherlands are modern-day Belgium. The Dutch and British are helping the Austrians, and while the French have far superior numbers there, the Netherlands, uh, both Austrian and Dutch, may be the most heavily fortified areas on earth at this time. So the French armies are getting bogged down in siege after siege, making slow, grinding progress in the background as the war goes on. And that's where things 
stand in the West at the end of 1745. With all this going on, you can see why Maria Theresa has no choice but to make peace with Frederick the Great. She's going to need those armies from Central Europe to turn things around in the West. But the French and Spanish also have another iron in the fire. And it's that rival claimant to the British throne I keep alluding to. Who's that guy? To understand, we need to jump back to the year 1688. That year, in an event called the Glorious Revolution, King James of the House of Stuart is overthrown. He is a Catholic in a majority Protestant country, and when he starts launching prosecutions on trumped-up charges against prominent Protestant clergy, a coalition of politicians call on William III of Orange to come and take over as king. William lands in England with a small invasion fleet. As expected, most of the British army defects to his side, and King James is overthrown in an almost bloodless coup. Through a series of inheritances, the throne eventually goes back to Queen Anne, another Stuart, and a Protestant, but thanks to a 1701 law banning Catholics from inheriting the throne, there's no eligible Stuart to succeed Anne when she dies childless in 1714. And the next in line is George, Elector of Hanover, who becomes King George I, who is the father of George II, who rules Britain during the War of Austrian Succession. But ever since King James has been overthrown, there's been a group of people called Jacobites who want the House of Stuart to return to the throne of England and Scotland. The word Jacobite comes from Jacobus, which is Latin for James. In 1715, these people, these Jacobites, even launch a small rebellion to try and keep the Stuarts on the throne when Queen Anne dies. And after this rebellion, as well as some others, uh, many Jacobites still live in Britain. Many live in exile in mainland Europe. The weird thing about the Jacobites is that they don't represent any particular ideology. Some are Catholics who don't like the rule that says that Catholics can't hold public office, but many of them are also what's called high church Episcopalians. These are members of the Church of England that still enjoy many of the old Catholic rituals that the Church of England has banned. And both of these groups hope to have more freedom under a Stuart king. Lots of Jacobite supporters are simply people who think King James was illegally deposed. These are often people who subscribe to the idea of the divine right of kings, the idea that monarchs are literally appointed by God. And if you can't trust God to choose your king, well, who can you trust? This isn't a question of religion either. There's some nationalism involved. The Stuart dynasty is a Scottish family. They'd been rulers of Scotland before they ruled England. Remember, not too long ago, Scotland and England were officially separate kingdoms, and there is a large base of Jacobite support in Scotland. Finally, the House of Stuart gets some support from people in England who see George I and George II as foreigners. Right there from Hanover in Germany, and even if you aren't a big fan of the Stuarts, at least they are British. Now, King James himself has been dead for many years, and his son, James Francis Edward Stuart, maintains a claim to the throne. In December 1743, he appoints his son Charles Stuart as his prince regent, with authority to act in his name. 
James Francis Edward Stewart lives in Rome on a papal pension, and there he remains. So King George II of Great Britain has no reason to believe that he's organizing any kind of uprising. Meanwhile, the young Charles Stewart is traveling the continent gathering weapons and support. The French offer an entire fleet to cover the invasion. The plan is to land Charles in Scotland and gather support from Jacobites within Great Britain while a French fleet distracts the British fleet, and more ships bring in 12,000 French invasion troops. With Britain distracted on the continent and in her colonies as well, King George will be caught off guard and they can overthrow his government in a heartbeat. The original attack is scheduled for January of 1744. If you'll recall when I talked about the French not pursuing the Austrians in 1744 when Frederick attacked them, I mentioned that there was a 12,000-man force at Dunkirk. Well, this is the force, but the force never actually gets to invade England. Uh, Stormy weather sinks some of the French fleet and... The invasion gets called off and those troops end up being redeployed. But in the summer of 1745, Charles Stuart tries his invasion plan again. This time, the French give him two older ships and some Irish volunteers from the French Army's Irish Brigade. That's a far cry from an entire fleet and an invasion army. And Charles's advisors, uh, including all of his Scottish contacts, all tell him that invading Britain without significant French military support is a non-starter. But he ignores them and he tries anyway. He thinks that if he shows even a little bit of support in Great Britain, that the French will see the legitimacy of this rebellion and send in a fleet and more troops. On July 11th, 1745, Charles's two ships set sail. But four days out from port, they're intercepted by a British warship. It engages the Elizabeth, the larger of Charles's two ships, and the Elizabeth is heavily damaged. It's forced to return to port in France, along with the Irish volunteers it's carrying. Charles himself is able to slip away and continue in his smaller ship. On July 23, 1745, with only a few hundred men, Charles lands on the tiny island of Eriskay, off the northwest coast of Scotland. And the rebellion almost ends right there. The clan chiefs on the island tell Charles what everyone warned him they would. No. They're sympathetic to his cause, but they're not impressed by his few hundred men and his one dinky little 16-gun ship. Meanwhile, a Royal Navy ship has trailed Charles to the island and is sitting outside in the harbor. The only reason the ship hasn't landed troops and arrested Charles is because the wind is blowing so hard that their ship can't get into the harbor. Charles manages to slip out of the harbor under the cover of darkness and goes to another island called the Island of Skye, which is even closer to the coast of the British mainland. Here, he manages to convince the local MacDonald clansmen to join his cause, and they become the first supporters of the ill-fated Jacobite uprising. They transfer over to the mainland and Charles sends his ship back to France to update the French and ask for more help. He hopes to build a base of support in the Scottish Highlands, where the Stuart family has connections that go back to time immemorial. Charles does manage to gather more support, including the influential Cameron clan. The clans meet in the village of Glenfinnan in north-central Scotland on August 19, 1745. There, Charles literally unfurls the banner of the House of Stuart and gives a speech to the assembled Highlanders. At this point, he only has around 1,500 men, hardly enough to challenge the mighty British Empire. 
but he plans to win a quick victory in Scotland, which he hopes will garner more support. He also faces logistical challenges right from the get-go. Due to the previous uprising in 1715 and another one in 1719, many of the Highland clans have been forcibly disarmed by the British crown. So when Charles first raises his army, he doesn't even have enough muskets for all of his men. So begins the rebellion that leaves him with two nicknames. He's known as Bonnie Prince Charlie by his supporters and Charles the Pretender by his opponents. London is already aware of what's going on. In a bit of bad timing for the rebellion, King George II has just returned from the Austrian Netherlands, where he's been engaged in the hard-fought campaign against the French. But nobody seems to appreciate the magnitude of the problem, so it's left to Sir John Cope, commander-in-chief of the army in Scotland, to put down the uprising. Unfortunately for Cope, the army at his disposal consists of around 3,000 poorly trained recruits. Almost all of the regular army is on the European mainland. Nobody was expecting a war to break out in Scotland, so Cope's been given some of the latest recruits. In modern-day terms, we'd say these soldiers have barely finished basic training. That's why you send them to a garrison deep in friendly territory. They can continue to drill and refine their skills without actually having to fight anybody until they're ready for it. Cope plans a march north to meet the rebels. Charles takes his men south on a forced march and sets up ambush in a narrow pass. But Cope gets wind of the ambush and he takes a different pass north. He's avoided the ambush, but this maneuver puts him out of position. He's north of Charles and now there's nothing between the rebel army and the Scottish capital of Edinburgh. Not only that, but many of Cope's recruits are from the area and several hundred desert. Many of these go straight to Charles' army and join up. Charles marches south to Edinburgh, but stops in the friendly city of Perth along the way. There he collects taxes and also waits for his allies to bring in more men. When he marches out of the city on September 11, 1745, he is a force of 2,400 men. Meanwhile, Cope has been up north, trying to recruit any Highlanders that are loyal to the crown. He's only able to raise 200 recruits, though. On September 16th, he sets sail from Aberdeen, hoping to beat Charles to Edinburgh by using sea travel. That same day, September 16th, Charles's army arrives outside of Edinburgh, the city council is loyal to King George, but they have no defenses other than a small local militia and the city's imposing medieval stone walls. However, they've just gotten word that Cope's army is on its way to relieve them, so they decide to buy time. They try to draw out negotiations as long as they can. Well, the Jacobites figure this out pretty quickly, and on the 17th, they set up some men in ambush out outside of Edinburgh's gates. In the evening, as it's starting to get dark, the Edinburgh negotiators return to the city in their coach. And when the gates open to let the coach in, the ambush party jumps out of the shadows, overpowers the guards, and opens all of the neighboring gates. Charles's army enters the city without firing a shot, and Edinburgh is his. Mostly, a small government garrison still controls Edinburgh Castle. The next day, the clansmen hold a ceremony declaring James Francis Edward Stuart the King of Scotland, and Charles as his regent. Cole lands his army nearby on the 19th determined to take back the city. Charles marches his army out. 
take in Edinburgh as a propaganda coup. But if he wants to get real support, he needs to show that his Jacobite army can beat the British in the field. The next evening, the evening of the 20th, the two armies meet. Cole has positioned his army in the town of Prestonpans, on the northeast Scottish coast. There is a hillside nearby, and Charles quickly occupies it to take the high ground. This would normally be an advantageous position, but as it turns out, there's a stretch of swamp between the other side of the hill and the British soldiers, and attacking through the swamp would bog down your troops. It, it would be suicide. So, in the pre-dawn hours of September 21st, at the urging of his advisors, Charles sends his men around the right side of the swamp to try and flank Cole's troops. Cole's scouts spot this, and he successfully pivots his army to face the new threat. The dragoons on the British right flank end up getting bunched up during the move, though. They can't maneuver properly, and when they see the first Jacobite soldiers advancing out of the mist, the inexperienced, disorganized dragoons run away. Meanwhile, while Cole has brought artillery with him, positioned at the right side of his line near the dragoons, uh, the artillery crews also run off when the dragoons run. So two officers and four enlisted men are stuck trying to operate six cannons and four mortars. As for the loyalists' left flank and the rest of the battle line, British historian Gregory Fremont Burns writes in his book the Jacobite Rebellion, 1745 to 1746, quote, On the left was equal disaster. As the Highlanders charged, the 14th Dragoons were given no order to attack, and when their commander was shot, the men fled, taking the reserve with them. Having fired their customary volley, the Highlanders cast aside their muskets and closed in with their broadswords. The infantry found their right flank as well as their front under attack and broke up in a matter of minutes. A detachment of 20 men from the 44th stood its ground in a ditch until surrounded and forced to surrender. All the infantry rapidly melted away, and although 450 of the cavalry were rallied by Cope, Lord Luton, Home, and others, these resolutely refused to engage the enemy. Nor would the fleeing infantry stand, despite threats made by officers wielding pistols. Total rout ensued, and soon the handful of officers and infantry who still held their ground were obliged to join the fugitives. The chaos enabled the clansmen to inflict severe losses on Cope, who retreated first to Coldstream and on to Berwick the following day. Thus, in an action lasting less than ten minutes, Cope's army was put to flight, and lost more than half its effective strength in prisoners. The rebels lost about 35 killed and 75 wounded. The government side suffered about 150 killed and at least a 1,000 made prisoner, plus all their baggage. Cope's military chest, containing between 3,000 and 4,000 pounds, also fell into the prince's hands. Preston Pans was a great, though temporary, blow to the Hanoverian cause, and conversely raised the morale of the Jacobites, who could no longer be held in contempt by their enemies as a mob of savages. The greatest advantage we derived from it, Chevalier de Johnstone, Lord George Murray's aide-de-camp, wrote, was the reputation that the prince's army acquired in the onset, which determined many of his partisans who were yet wavering to declare themselves openly in his favor. Of at least equal significance, the outcome of the battle left Scotland almost entirely bereft of government troops, with the exception of Edinburgh Castle, Stirling, and the Highland Forts. The Jacobites, it seemed, were now a serious force to be reckoned with. Unquote. At Preston Pans, the Jacobites have successfully defeated the weakest and least intimidating army King George has to throw at them and it's the high-water mark of their success. 
from here on out, it's mostly downhill for the Jacobite cause, although, as you'll see, they get surprisingly close. But the cause is really doomed from the beginning, and this is true for a couple of reasons. The most obvious is that even if Charles had ten times the number of men at his disposal, he would still have a hard time conquering Great Britain. That's not going to happen without French help, and even then it would be very hard. But there are other deeper issues. Most importantly, as I said earlier, the Jacobites don't have an overarching political ideology besides replacing the House of Hanover with the House of Stuart. So far, everybody has been able to agree on a course of action. But now, cracks are starting to form. Charles wants to move south into England and strike for London, but not all the Jacobites are on board. Most of Charles's Scottish supporters want him to sit back in Scotland and wait for King George's response. Scotland is a defensible country, and with a few thousand determined defenders, Edinburgh could last for a year or more under siege. There are many other fortified locations, and mounted passes, and wooded wildernesses. Draw the English out, the argument goes. Let them extend their supply lines, and let the Scottish fight on their own territory. Besides, What interest would Scottish clans have in expanding their reach outside of Scotland? Their only interest is in having a Stuart on the Scottish throne. To them, the 1707 Act of Union uniting the two kingdoms was a legal aberration. Before that, England and Scotland had been two kingdoms sharing the same royal family. Maybe England and Scotland will have the same king, maybe they won't. But Scotland will be an independent kingdom, and replacing George II as king of England is low on their list of priorities. Charles's other supporters would beg to differ. For his Irish and Catholic supporters, having Charles's father James as king of Scotland alone is completely useless. They need a Stuart king on the English throne so he can give the Irish back their freedoms and the Catholics back their right to hold office. As his father's regent, Charles tries to thread the needle. He abrogates the Act of Union that had officially united Scotland and England and declares that the two thrones are separate. At the same time, he also repeals the Act of Settlement, the law that had forbidden Catholics from holding public office. He hopes to appease both his Scottish and his Irish supporters and keep attracting more recruits. Following the Battle of Preston Pans, Charles remains in Edinburgh for six weeks. Much of his efforts go into recruiting, and he raises hundreds of more recruits from the surrounding areas. More importantly, A ship arrives from France, delivering much-needed muskets for the Jacobite army. It also delivers a few French artillery pieces and French crews to run them, as well as a French military attaché. Many of the leading clansmen are upset. Charles has been promising a French army, and this is what they get? But Charles assures them that this is just the first of many shipments and that a regular French army is coming. In fact, there is no such army. But it's tough to say whether Charles is lying to his followers or whether the French are lying to him. The French do have a fleet at Dunkirk and they're threatening to launch an invasion, but It seems to be a dummy invasion fleet without any actual invasion army to back it up. The French are trying to bluff the British into deploying troops away from the European mainland, and one point of view says that Charles Stuart is a pawn in their geopolitical games. On the other hand, 
Charles may know that there's no army, and he's telling his followers that there is because he thinks he can really take London if he gets enough support from discontented Scotch, Irish, and other groups. Even if Charles isn't lying about the French, he does lie to the clan chiefs about his level of support in England. He tells them that there are groups of Jacobites in every English town, ready to rise up as soon as his army enters the country. This is categorically false. Almost nobody in England supports the Stuarts, at least not enough to take up arms for them. It's an important distinction, and this makes sense if you look at the issues at play. For one thing, the English people, by and large, are not big fans of the idea of an absolute monarchy. They like a strong parliament and a weak king, thank you very much, so you won't find a lot of people agitating for the return of the Stuarts on that basis. As for the religious issues, there are more Anglicans in England than in Scotland and Ireland. Unlike in Ireland, there are fewer Catholics who are upset at religious discrimination, and the same goes for High Church Episcopalians who are mostly located in Scotland. If you're an Anglican, freedom of religion isn't an issue for you personally. You already have it. No, maybe you've read a lot of Enlightenment writers, and you're a progressive person, and you agree that the Catholics and High Church Episcopalians should be treated better. But are you really willing to pick up a gun and risk your life for somebody else's religious freedom? Probably not. As for people who object to a king with German lineage... Why would an English nationalist think a king with Scottish lineage was any better? That's just another foreign king. Now, there might be a few proto-British nationalists at this point, but there aren't enough to make a difference. In other words, most of the Jacobites who are expecting a ton of support are living in a fantasy world. They believe they'll get their support from a French invasion army and that thousands of Englishmen stand ready to join their cause. Instead, they are in for a harsh dose of reality. The government has already recalled 12,000 troops from the Austrian Netherlands to deal with the Jacobite threat and that force is now marching north under the command of General George Wade. Ultimately, Charles convinces his men to move south into the county of Cumbria in northwestern England, just south of the Scottish border. Cumbria, along with the neighboring counties of Northumberland and Lancashire, was the source of most English support for the House of Stuart during previous uprisings, so... If you're going to raise support in England, this is a sensible place to go. When they leave Edinburgh on November 1st, 1745, the Jacobite army has a total strength of nearly 6,000, with 5,000 infantry, 500 cavalry, and 13 artillery pieces. It's well-armed and well-supplied, but it still faces the prospect of fighting a force of British regulars more than twice its number. And these British troops from the Austrian Netherlands aren't raw recruits prone to panic. These are hardened veterans of the war on the European continent, and they're going to be tougher to crack. On November 9th, the Jacobite army reaches Carlisle, a city in Cumbria where they want to establish their headquarters. The mayor and the city council refuse to surrender the city, and the local militia pledges to keep the Jacobites out. But the city's leaders can't establish contact with General Wade. They don't know where he is, or whether he even knows they're in danger. On November 15th, Fearing what might happen if the Jacobites storm the city, they surrender. 
Charles's army seizes several cannons, over a thousand muskets, a hundred barrels of gunpowder, and unspecified quantities of other valuable supplies. What they don't find in Carlisle, despite Charles's promises, is a surge of eager recruits. Vanishingly few Englishmen are willing to join the Jacobite cause. Meanwhile, General Wade has finally gotten word of the Jacobite attack on Carlisle, but he only finds out on November 16th, the day after the fall of the city. Furious, he marches out to attack the Jacobites, but winter is coming on and supplying his army is going to be difficult. A couple of days later, he thinks the better of it and returns to his base in Newcastle in northeastern England. He figures he'll wait out the winter and deal with the Jacobites come spring. At this point, Charles is in a position to strike two major loyalist armies. There is a force occupying the city of Stirling, back up in Scotland to his north. Taking Stirling could secure his hold over Scotland and garner the loyalty of more clans. Remember, a lot of people in Scotland support him, but fear the consequences of openly joining the rebellion. It's treason. You could be hung. You could have your property confiscated. You could be exiled to the colonies. I mean, you might wake up a month later in Philadelphia. By kicking government troops out of Scotland altogether... Charles could show his would-be supporters that the rebellion has a real chance of succeeding. Alternatively, he could go east and attack General Wade's army at Newcastle. He'd be outnumbered, and it probably wouldn't be advisable, but if you imagine somebody like Frederick the Great in this situation, you could... Picture some kind of daring sneak attack that knocks Wade's army out of action before they know what's hit them. Well, instead of doing the sensible thing, kicking the loyalists out of Stirling, or even doing the daring thing, attacking General Wade, Charles does the stupid thing. He somehow convinces his generals to march even further south into England, further from his base of support. The Jacobite army ends up reaching as far south as Derby in central England, where they arrive in early December. But the results of this deep incursion have been disappointing. They've raised only a few hundred more men, with their largest gain being 120 recruits from the city of Manchester. Like I said, there just aren't many Englishmen willing to join this cause. On December 6, 1745, Charles and his generals hold a war council. The weather is worsening by the day, and they're dangerously far from Scotland. King George has continued to send more regulars to the mainland, and there's another army twice their size already marching in the vicinity under the command of the Duke of Cumberland. They ultimately decide to go back to Scotland and attempt to take the city of Stirling, which is what they probably should have done in the first place. During this march back, the local population is hostile. Some local militia even fire their guns at the Jacobites. The retreat to Scotland turns into a daring escape as the Duke of Cumberland pursues them. British regular forces even catch up with the Jacobites on December 18th near the town of Clifton. Cavalry and the British advance guard catch up with infantry at the back of the Jacobite army. But in this part of the country, the roads are narrow and lined with hedges, so the cavalry can't form up for a proper attack. Every time they try, Jacobite infantrymen turn around and shoot them down. At one point... Some Jacobites even mount a countercharge with their broadswords, and the British forces disengage. On December 20th, Charles' army crosses back into Scotland. He leaves a symbolic force of around 400 men at the town of Carlisle, just so he can say he still has forces on the ground in England. 
This turns out to be foolish, since those 400 men are quickly overpowered and captured on December 30th. By January 3rd, 1746, events have shown that Charles really, really should have stayed in Scotland. More clans have risen up to support him, and over 4,000 young men join his army. Word comes that some loyalist clans have been defeated in battle by Jacobite clans, further bolstering the Jacobite cause. The fact that there's ongoing dispute among the clans shows that Scotland is by no means united in support for the House of Stuart, but the large number of recruits shows that the support is real. Imagine what would have happened if Charles had stayed in Scotland to begin with and locked down control of one kingdom before trying to tackle another. As per their plan, the rebels attack the British-held city of Stirling and take it on January 9th, although, like Edinburgh before it, they have to lay siege to the castle inside the city where loyalist troops still hold out. On January 15th, a British loyalist army of around 15,000 comes to relieve Stirling Castle. Charles sends 6,000 men to meet them, while 1,200 remain in Stirling holding down the siege. This battle, called the Battle of Falkirk, is one of the great David versus Goliath battles of history. The Loyalists open with a cavalry charge, which falls back under Jacobite musket fire. The Jacobites charge after the cavalry and over a hill where they encounter the right flank of the Loyalist infantry. The Loyalists, taken by surprise, turn and run. And other British soldiers further down the line see them running, so they also run, and most of the Loyalist army retreats. Some troops on the left flank hold their ground, turn, and fire at the Jacobites who are running past them. So they're able to fire at these Jacobites from the flank, inflicting a lot of damage and disorienting them. And now it's the Jacobites' turn to run away, and most of them flee the field. But there's still that small group of Irish volunteers we talked about who are on loan from the French army. And these volunteers from the French-Irish Brigade hold their ground and end up occupying the small village of Falkirk. So despite the fact that almost all of his men fled the field, Charles is able to claim victory at the Battle of Falkirk. Not that the Loyalist forces did any better, it's Pretty embarrassing when most of your army runs away at the mere sight of an enemy that they outnumber more than two to one. Anyway, despite this tactical victory, the Jacobite forces are now on borrowed time. Government forces have slowly closed the noose over the course of the winter. And they continue to do so, and the heaviest blow comes on February 25th, 1746. That day, the Loyalist troops enter the port city of Aberdeen, which had been the last seaport under Jacobite control. This shuts off Charles's route of supplies from France. Bonnie Prince Charles is about to learn what many other leaders have learned in many other rebellions. You can beat the government again and again, but oftentimes they only have to beat you once. The British Empire has unfathomable resources to draw on. Charles has the support of some Scottish clans, Without any access to French supplies or reinforcements from Ireland or from anywhere else. Despite this, the British government is unnerved. Prior to Falkirk, King George had given a speech in Parliament, confidently asserting that the government's troops would prevail over the rebels. So far, in pitched battles, the Jacobites are two for two. 
and it's easy to see why the king might be frustrated. He appoints a new commander to put down the rebels, the Lord of Cumberland. Cumberland is a veteran of the conflicts on the European continent and has years of experience leading men in pitched battle. And if you've been paying attention, he's also already given chase to Charles' army at one point and nearly caught them. Charles abandons the siege of Stirling and retreats further north, this time hoping to capture all the forts in the northern highlands. Cumberland's army follows, but is hampered by a large baggage train, so it's slower than Charles' army. But Charles is retreating into a smaller and smaller geographic area, and Cumberland finally catches up with him in the spring and the two armies meet on April 16, 1746, at the town of Culloden. The Jacobite army is once again outnumbered, this time by around 9,000 to 5,400. They take up what looks like a good defensive position between a walled enclosure and a marsh, which should force the government forces to come right at them. By Forming a smaller front, they can negate the advantage of loyalist numbers. But two things ruin this plan. First, loyalist grenadiers breach the walls of the enclosure on the Jacobite left flank, and they get around the side of their army. Secondly, loyalist cannons open up a bombardment at extreme range, while most of their troops hang back to begin with. The Jacobite troops are ferocious on the attack. They like to shoot at you with muskets and then charge in with broadswords, which is a little bit outdated at this point, but pretty intimidating, and it has a morale effect. Right? They keep causing these British troops to run, but they're not all that disciplined on the defense, and... After a few minutes of this long-range bombardment, they break discipline and charge. This is better than running away, but it's still a disaster. The marshy ground in the area slows their charge, just as Charles had hoped that it would hamper a loyalist attack. At the same time, the right side of the Jacobite line moves forward much faster than the left because the ground in that area is drier. And when they get into closer range, the Loyalists open fire with canister shot. It's carnage, right? Imagine a cannon that shoots hundreds of smaller projectiles, like a giant shotgun, and again... The Jacobites could have inflicted that kind of damage on the Loyalists had they maintained discipline and maybe fought off that little grenadier attack on their left flank and just waited for the main assault. And during this attack, not only do the Jacobites take a lot of casualties, they also put themselves out in the open. The sides of the army aren't anchored like they were, and Using his superior numbers, the Duke of Cumberland is able to send his troops out around their sides, and shortly the Jacobites find themselves almost entirely surrounded. A few men see what's happening and run away, and a few more join them, and within minutes the battle has turned into a rout. Cumberland orders his cavalry to pursue them and to take no prisoners. By the end of the battle and the pursuit, Charles's army has lost around 2,000 dead. That's almost a 40% casualty rate, and that's not counting wounded. The Jacobite army scatters, with everyone trying to stay one step ahead of government troops. It's every man for himself. Even Charles has to be smuggled out of the country on a small merchant ship, disguised as a maid named Betty Burke. He intends to return with French troops at his back, but he's never successful at convincing the French to launch that invasion. 
and why should they? They've successfully distracted the British at a crucial time in their war. They've forced tens of thousands of British troops to return to the British Isles, and all of this at a fraction of the cost of a real and risky invasion attempt. In the aftermath of the battle, Jacobites are treated differently depending on their military status. Several hundred of those who had served under Charles are volunteers who hold commissions in the French army, most of them members of the Irish Brigade. These men are held as prisoners of war and later repatriated to France as part of a prisoner exchange. Over 3,500 British Jacobites are captured, and they're charged with treason. But despite treason being a capital offense, only 120 of them are actually executed. 900 are pardoned, and unfortunately 650 of them die in prison while awaiting trial. Many of these 650 men had been wounded in battle and die of infections. The remaining 1,800 or so are convicted of treason, but they're given a reduced sentence of exile and shipped off to the colonies. Despite all of this, the Jacobite cause will continue to attract followers for decades. Charles secretly visits London in 1750 to try and raise support, although this effort comes to nothing. Unrest and sporadic lawlessness continue in Scotland for many years. As late as 1756, ten years after the Jacobite uprising, the British government will still maintain 60 army patrols in Scotland. Another major consequence of the failure of this rebellion is that a lot of Jacobites self-deport from Great Britain. Many move to the colonies, but most move to mainland Europe, most commonly to France. Over the next several decades, you'll see a lot of Jacobites serving in the French military. As late as the Napoleonic era, you have the famous Irish Legion. And while most of those guys will be your more run-of-the-mill Irish separatists, a lot of them are descended from exiled Jacobites in the Irish Brigade, and their families have been in French military service for a few generations. Regardless of any long-term implications, spring of 1746 brings domestic peace to Great Britain. This is fortunate not just because peace is a good thing, but because the British have a lot of other things to be worried about. Their allies in Austria and the Netherlands are barely holding their own on the European continent. At the same time, the French are giving them trouble across their colonial empire, from India to North America. The next phase of the War of the Austrian Succession will unfold across all of these theaters. And when it ends, all the bad blood that's been built up over the course of these last several years will result in a diplomatic revolution that reshapes the course of European politics. And we'll talk about that in the next episode. Some of the groundwork for that diplomatic revolution has already been laid in Central Europe. By launching his two invasions of Austrian territory, Frederick the Great has secured control of the rich, populous region of Silesia and made Prussia into a legitimate regional power. By twice making a separate peace and by generally going back on every treaty he makes, he's also put Prussia into a position where it will need to defend those gains. This sets up not just the diplomatic revolution, but the world's next major conflict, the Seven Years' War. And that's why it's relevant.
Hello again. It's me, Dan. This is a friendly reminder that if you're only listening to the audio podcast, you're not getting all of my content. I also have a Patreon channel called Dan's War College. Each month, I break down a historical battle, weapon, or tactic and explain how it works. This is a video series with maps, graphics, and other helpful visual aids, and you can get it all for just $5 a month. We've done 10 episodes so far, and some of these have even been patron requests, because I do take requests. You can find the link to the Patreon channel in the episode description. And if you're on the fence, episode 5 of Dan's War College is currently publicly available, so you can check that one out and get a taste for what the channel is like. Of course, not everybody wants to spend $5 a month for a monthly video, and who can blame you? There are so many channels and subscription services out there that it's just impossible to sign up for all of them. But if you still want to support the show, you can share it with your friends or post a link on social media. Shows like this grow by word of mouth. And if the channel's growth is any indication, you guys are great advertisers. Thanks so much, and please keep it up. And if your podcast service lets you leave a review, please do so. If you want to follow Relevant History on social media, you can find links in the description for that as well. Or just go to Twitter and find at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast. If you want to send me an email, you can write to Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast at gmail.com. Tell me what you liked, or if you think I got something wrong, tell me that too. You can also visit the show's website at dantollerpodcast.com. Once again, that's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.